Every month, the federal government spends hundreds of billions, hundreds of billions on entitlement programs. Of course, that's all right because all of that money goes toward helping the poor. If you think that, I'm afraid you have to think again. Joining us today, John Kogan, the author of The High Cost of Good Intentions, A History of U.S. Federal Entitlement Programs. John Kogan, welcome. Well, thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here. John, first things first. What are we talking about when we're talking about entitlement programs? Why are they a separate category different from other kinds of spending? Well, it's actually a great, a great question to start off with, Peter. Um, you know, entitlements have come to mean very different things to different people. To some people, an entitlement is a handout. It's an unearned benefit. Right. So for them, entitlements are kind of a, um, a derogatory term. Um, to other people, an entitlement is a benefit that cannot be taken away. A person has a legal right uh, to that benefit, and that right is irre irrevocable. And so we have very different views about what entitlements are. For us today, um, we'll adopt the non-loaded definition right. of entitlements. An entitlement is simply a, um, an entitlement program is simply a program that provides a benefit under the law to anyone who qualifies for the, the uh, benefit as provided in the law. So let's take Social Security as a good example. Uh, if you've worked in a covered job for 10 years and you reach the age of 66, you are entitled under the law to receive a benefit. You have a legal right to receiving that benefit. But since these benefits are prescribed in law, uh, Congress can write another law to change those benefits. And so the legal right is a little bit attenuated in the sense that any future Congress can change uh, that right. So what are the best examples of entitlements, the entitlements that I cover in the book? Well, there's Social Security, Medicare, food stamps, the Medicaid program, supplemental security income, the earned income tax credit. So there's a bevy of, of these programs. What makes them different right. Right, than, than other programs in the budget is that from an expenditure or budgetary standpoint, they are open-ended. The amount that gets expended in any year on an entitlement is determined by the number of people that qualify for the benefit and the benefits that are paid to each qualified person. And so ex ante, when the government's trying to set a budget for the total, uh, it has to estimate the number of entitled persons, the number of recipients, and it has to estimate the average benefit that each one will get. In a very complex country with a lot of moving parts, that's a very difficult thing to do. You can only kind of know after the fact th what an entitlement expenditure is going to be. You can't forecast it for very well in advance. Okay. So the, the critical distinction, say for example on defense spending, Congress says this year we will spend $750 billion. Department of Defense, you figure out how to spend that. But on entitlement spending, God tells you how many 66-year-olds there are in America. There just are so and so many 66-year-olds. Right. And Congress, I, God, but the demographics tell Congress how much it's going to spend. Absolutely right. The demographics, the economic conditions, and the behavior of individuals who might wish to qualify for that benefit. 55% okay. of all U.S. households receive cash or in-kind assistance from at least one major federal entitlement program. The $2.4 trillion the federal government currently spends annually on entitlements equals $7,500 for every man, woman, and child living in the United States. Close quote. Now, what I find so striking about that is that I immediately rem remembered the controversy when what, five years ago Mitt Romney was running for president, and in off what he thought was an off-the-record moment, he said to a, a group of donors, look, folks, we have a serious problem. 47% of people in this country receive federal benefits, so of course they're going to vote for bigger government. And here, if you measure it by household, it's well over half. How can this be, John? When you go back and look at the origins of each of these modern right. entitlements, 
Each one was established with what you and I would agree, and I'm sure most of your uh, listeners would agree, right. is, is a, a set of good intentions. Um, the Great Society and the New Deal programs were established to provide a safety net against poverty for those in old age and for those younger people who uh, ended up in poverty through no fault of their own. Right. From that small, honorable beginning, we end up with a set of programs, as you said, that costs 7500 for every man, woman, and child and, and provide assistance to over half of the population. The amount the federal government spends each year on entitlement programs is five times the money necessary to lift every person out of poverty. So the original good intention, let's help the poor. And we are now spending five times more than necessary to satisfy that original and honorable good intention. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? It's a very good way of illustrating just how different the current system is from those original noble intentions. Very little goes to alleviating poverty. Okay. You said 20%. The New Deal broke new ground by extending entitlements to people in the general population who had performed no particular service to the federal government, close quote. Why is that an important departure? Well, when you think about a pension or entitlements prior to uh, the New Deal, they were confined to wartime uh, soldiers who had suffered um, disabilities. Uh, and eventually that group, it was a closed group, only people who served could get it, and eventually that group would pass on. The New Deal entitlements, on the other hand, opened up entitlements to members of the general population who had never performed any service to their country. So to individuals, just because they reached a particular age, it opened up unemployment A population benefits. that would constantly renew itself. And then it would, right. So there was no end to it. Right? right. And this phenomenon where it's once you've granted a benefit, it's very difficult to take it away when you have this continually renewable group that's entering, the benefits continue to escalate. If you have a case, on the other hand, with wartime veterans, one group passes away, another war starts, and you're in effect starting over again. You get to rethink it, rethink at least in theory. It. That's right, and try a reset. Democrats raised the practice of using entitlements for electoral gain to a finely honed skill. From the end of World War II through 1975, seven of the 10 legislative increases in Social Security monthly benefits took effect during an election year. In early 1972, the process was going along as normal. The House had agreed to a something like a 5% increase. Senate wanted a benefit increase that was a little bit higher to compensate individuals for inflation. But it was an election year. And there were four candidates on the Democratic side running for uh, the party's nomination. McGovern, Muskie. M McGovern, Muskie, Mills. Wilbur Mills. Yes, the chairman of the committee that writes Social Security legislation. Right and the happy warrior, Hubert, Hubert Humphrey. Humphrey. Right. And so the bidding process began after the Senate. Muskie came in with a 20% benefit hike, Mills a 20% benefit hike, McGovern a 20% benefit hike. These are big and hikes. Big, big increases for everybody on the rolls then, and of course it would apply Forever. to all future recipients as well. And so then uh, Hubert Humphrey uh, capped off the bidding with a 25% uh, increase in benefits. So this is all in the spring of 1972. Right. So then the debt ceiling was set to expire at midnight on June 30th. And the Democrats got together and proposed to, uh, to um, add to that debt ceiling bill a 20% increase in Social Security benefits. So they did that a few days before the 30th, uh, debated it, uh, went, to the, uh, went for a vote uh, on the 30th, got sent over to the House of Representatives at the last minute. Uh, the House had no other alternative but to sign the bill, or to pass the bill, uh, and Richard Nixon signed the debt ceiling bill with the 20% increase uh, right before midnight. Nixon was upset. He didn't think this was very fiscally responsible and said so in his uh, veto message, or his, his, his signing, signing message, message, excuse me, his signing message. The um, scheduled increase 
was to occur in the October Social Security checks. Just uh, before November, exactly. which is election month. Exactly. Right. All right. So when the checks went out to over 25 million recipients, it contained a little note from the Social Security Administration, which said your check contains a 20% benefit increase um, due to the actions of the 93rd Congress and Richard M. Nixon. <laughs> Making it Who clear. won re-election right. in 1972. Right. That's right. Social Security and Medicare have reduced the perceived need by young workers to save for their retirement and have induced senior citizens to, go for, to forego years of productive and rewarding employment. Close quote. Well, if you're not saving when you should be saving and you're not, you, you, you retire too early, that's a distortion of the entire workforce, of people's entire careers. With such a large fraction of the population receiving assistance, the incentive effects that the assistance carries with it is going to have an effect upon the economy as a whole. The whole economy. Right. And so if we go back 30, 40 years, when we thought about the welfare system, we would recognize that our efforts to help people often ended up being counterproductive because we created incentives for individuals to um, stay out of the labor force, to not get married, to have a child out of wedlock, uh, um, actions that were probably not necessarily in the long-term interests of those individuals. Right. So we recognize that along with the assistance that we were providing to individuals in need, we had to be mindful of the incentives that we were creating for these individuals to behave in certain ways. Right. Now that 54, 55 percent of the of the um, uh, of the population is receiving these benefits, we've we now have an economy wide problem. It used to be a microcosm of welfare right. recipients. Now it's an economy wide problem. In 1965, the first year of the Great Society, the illegitimacy rate among African Americans was 25%. Today, after more than half a century of the Great Society, the illegitimacy rate among whites is 36%, among Hispanics is more than 50%, and among African Americans is more than 72%. And your argument is that some unknowable portion, but some portion of that, is because of, well, of federal entitlement programs. Yes, I think. Um, we have been spending hundreds of billions of dollars to dissolve the American family. Well, I wouldn't quite put it as, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> as strongly as that. I would think about it a, a, a little bit uh, differently. That is, I would go back to the title of the book, that the intentions of these programs are good. Uh, they're honorable, they're noble. Um, but not enough attention has been paid to the cost that is incurred both at the individual level and at the national level. And we need to pay more attention to those costs. And when it comes to welfare, try to design programs that provide that assistance to those who, through, through no fault of their own, uh, are in poverty, uh, but at the same time don't have these incentives for counterproductive behavior.